Hey, beautiful people. I hope you're having an excellent day. I wasn't going to say anything about this, but a lot of people have asked me to make a few comments, and I feel like I should. At the time of, um, the time of this taping, we're three or four days past the um, mass shooting in Orlando at the uh, Pulse nightclub that is to date the um, of all the uh, massacres that have happened in the last few years this was the um, considered the worst because it had the uh, largest number of uh, fatalities I um, am in a personal time of mourning um, I always am after these things happen uh, especially when there's something that you can relate to, like for instance, um, when Sandy Hook happened, if you have children or grandchildren, my grandchildren are the ages of those kids that were shot, you you feel differently about it because you can't help but think, my God, what in the world must those people be going through and how do they deal with it? Um, the shooting that happened a year ago at um, Mother Emanuel in Charleston I can't relate to it uh, as a being a man of color, but I can uh, relate to it as what it is to be a pastor of a church and how horrible that was that somebody came in and opened fire on um, people there and just having a Bible study. Um, Monday night of this week, two nights ago, we went to a... Um, a vigil over at the uh, Center for Civil and Human Rights, and several thousand people were out there. And that that one was very meaningful to me because um, I do relate to this uh, shooting a little differently because it seems that um, the one thing that Orlando and Charleston have in common is these were not your standard uh, terrorist attacks. I know this um, this guy that did the shooting, he pledged allegiance to ISIS, but he was born here in the United States. He's not an immigrant. He was born not far from where Donald Trump was born in Queens. And certainly the kid uh, that went in, I don't even want to say his name, that went in and shot the people at uh, Charleston, he was specifically a racist who was there to take out black people. So I'm not saying that one thing is worse than the other. I'm just saying there's a little different shade of interpretation. Uh, last night, I was part of a vigil at um, historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. Very honored to be a part of it. Um, very powerful evening, ministers and rabbis and um, lobbyists, all kind of people were involved. And I was glad that they connected the dots between Charleston and Orlando because these two shootings were not just random shootings. They weren't just crazy, like a Timothy McVeigh kind of thing. I mean, they, these, this was a specific, in Charleston, it was specifically African-Americans that were targeted. And um, the shooting in Orlando is a little complex because you can sort of find a six degrees of separation with uh, radical Islam or whatever you want to call it. But this one specifically is different because um, uh, a gay nightclub was, um, and gay people specifically were targeted. And uh, I usually don't even like to comment on these things till we know a little bit more about it. And so the news is still uh, unfolding every day. So I, I'm at the time of this taping, I'm saying this four days after the shooting, going on the information that we have at this point. And uh, apparently, uh, the, uh, the man who shot, who was of uh, Afghan um, descent, but was American, uh, frequent, frequented this nightclub, frequented um, uh, gay dating sites, uh, knew about this nightclub. So there's a lot of issues there. I have my, my own interpretation of that is... Um, and I have no way of knowing, but it, what it feels like to me instinctually as a gay man and as a man who has been counseling with people in the ministry for the last 43 years, it seems to me that that's, that's a, 
a gay man who knows he's gay but can't be gay because his religion has told him that it's um, whatever the Quran's equivalent of the word abomination. And so in the um, spirit of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was gay, or John Wayne Gacy, who was gay, who hated himself and therefore projected that hatred on gay people, uh, this guy, I'm not completely removing it from um, a terrorist attack, but it's at least a terrorist attack, attack slash hate crime. And um, this one feels close to home. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, Monday night we were standing out there at the vigil, and it's mostly LGBT people out there. Uh, I really felt connected, and um, when they read the names of the 49 people, you know, you hear those names and their ages. They're all really young, and uh, a very emotional evening, but also cathartic because you you want to do something. You want to respond. And I, I don't want to get involved in the, I mean, the same old argument between conservatives and liberals about gun control. It started like the minute the news came out about it. And it's just, I, I can't bear to read it. That's why I don't, I don't post my political views on social media, not because I'm afraid of confrontation, but I just, you know, the scripture says there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. And I think when people are dead, had just been slaughtered, you know, just give it a rest for a few minutes before you start weighing in and politicizing everything. And it, besides, it's the same old polarizing argument. Nobody changes anybody else's minds. You see it however you see it. I have my own feelings about it, but I know I've got people that uh, are a part of my ministry that probably would completely disagree with me. And because I'm not a control freak, I, you know, I say, well, let's agree to disagree as long as you're nice about it and as long as you don't want to fight with me about it because I don't want to argue. Uh, some of the stuff that I read that people, people who I've known for years, the stuff they post is just, I mean, it literally makes my stomach hurt to read it and, and it's depressing. People that sat under my ministry for years, I think, well, clearly I had absolutely no influence on your thinking whatsoever. So as a Pastor, that's a little discouraging. As a friend, I read some things that people write and I think, how in the world are you even friends with me? If, if that's what you believe, um, some people are clueless. They don't realize how racist and homophobic they sound. And you just have to do the Father forgive them for they don't know what they do piece and try to get through it. But here's the reason I wanted to say something about this specifically. Um, I don't even know about this yet. I was just uh, driving home a few minutes ago and Ken texted me. He's working late. If you don't, that's my husband, if you don't know who that is. And he said, what's going on in the news? I heard that they're making threats on gay bars and gay establishments in Atlanta. And I said, I don't know. I haven't seen the news yet. And I haven't. I just, I just walked right in and, and turned on the computer to uh, record this. Um, I said this last night at Ebenezer. I, I, I have read some things that people, I don't want to say their names, but famous evangelists, televangelists, famous um, heads of uh, Christian television networks. You know, it's the same old, same old that I have heard from fundamentalist Christians for the last six years since I came out. You know, it's wrath of God. The wrath of God visited on these Homosexuals, they always make sure they say homosexuals because it because they got to make sure they get the word sex in there. Uh, these guys really know what they're doing, and gay sounds too benign to them, so they, they punch it up. You listen to these fundamentalists, it's homosexuals. Like they put the, they make sure that syllable is emphasized. And, you know, I, because I know what the ministry's really like, I see through it, and I've heard guys preach that same line who personally were gay. And they, to me, are the lowest form on the, uh, of life on the ministry food chain because they know they're gay and they just play to their audience. I, God, I hate that. At least I never did that uh, before I came out. Anyway, it doesn't surprise me, but it also makes me want to say to some of these people who in the same breath 
will say, we're praying for Orlando. I want to say, don't, don't pray for Orlando. Stop being part of the problem. Because what you're preaching, the fundamentalism, whether it's out of the Quran or the Torah or the Bible, it's the same thing. You're still taking scriptures out of context and marginalizing people. And you know that's not what that scripture is talking about. Just the other day, a very respected Bible teacher who I didn't even realize we were still Facebook friends because you know, I lost so many friends of the Christian community when I came out. But um, he inboxed me and he said, look, I don't, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm honestly asking. He said, I have been studying the scriptures, and this guy is highly respected, very learned. He said, I have come to the conclusion the Bible doesn't actually actually say anything about homosexuality as we know it. He said, I, I read things about gang rape and ancient cultures, terrorizing other cultures or uh, idolatry in the temple. He said, but nothing that seems to apply. And he said, do you have any resource uh, material to recommend? And I said, well, first of all, you're exactly right. The Bible doesn't say anything about responsible gay people living in the 21st century or about sexual orientation. Jesus certainly didn't. And um, I told him about my book. I said, but there are other books that are more scholarly that really go into it even more in depth than I did. And I recommended them to him. And I said, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah has no more relevance to my life than it does to you, yours. Um, that's a story about a warped society where men were wanting to gang rape angels because that's like a prison gang mentality. That's not about sexual orientation. And Romans chapter one that I have had cut and pasted to me probably 3,500 times in the last six years, and I've already done videos about it, written a book about it, has no relevance to my life. That's talking about uh, boy prostitutes in the temple and uh it talks about people not being thankful. I am thankful. It talks about people um, worshiping the images of reptiles and birds. I've never done that. I don't even know any gay person that's done that. So, you know, I've said my piece about that. Uh, I'm not a novice. I'm an elder in the church. If uh, when it comes to me personally, if people think I'm not uh, qualified to call myself a Christian or a minister, that just shows how completely ignorant they are. And the scripture says, let those who are ignorant be ignorant still and don't cast your pearls before swine. So I, I don't even, I just shake the dust off my feet from that. But I was um, thinking about the insensitivity of these guys who, you know, there are people burying their sons right now and they're on TV saying this was the wrath of God. That is demonic. <laughs> I just want to ask some of these guys, how can you? Be so mean. I mean, really? How can you be that unfeeling? You can't find enough compassion in you just to shut your mouth for a few hours and let these grieving people bury their children without you chiming in and saying the same old crap that you've been saying and spare me the nonsense of saying you're praying for Orlando because you're not. It's the same kind of BS when people say, love the sinner, hate the sin. That is, that's just a lie. You do not love the sinner and you know you don't. So don't even say it. Just stop being part of the machine that creates these kind of guys who can't help that they're gay, but don't know how to work it out with their theology. And so they take it out on other people. It's their way of projecting on them. I also don't want to say this man's name because I've known him for years. My family's known him, and I'm not. I don't. I don't trash people, and you know the scripture says don't speak evil of dignitaries. So I, I really try to refrain from this. But um, you can find this online. But there's a, a compilation of false prophecies of his, including. Uh, <laughs> Fidel Castro is going to die in the mid-90s. Well, here it is, 2016. Castro, he may not be well, but he's alive. And um, But the first one on, the, uh, on this is, um, I'm assuming this must have been around the late 80s. And he says in his, um, I won't try to imitate his accent, but he says, the, and the Spirit says to me, that uh, somewhere around 1994 or 95, I will destroy the homosexual community with fire, with fire. And it's 
first of all, I mean, it's obviously a false prophecy because, I mean, I was just across the, the, the um, Center for Civil Rights across the street from here. Believe me, thousands of people who are LGBT are alive in 2016. And thankfully, it's not the Old Testament. So, you know, you don't have to get stoned for false prophecies. But what was chilling to me is that when he says, the Holy Spirit tells me to tell you I will destroy the homosexual community in 1994, it's the applause and the cheers that come from the people. That's what's so sickening to me. Prophecy is supposed to edify, exhort, and comfort. Why wouldn't you, if you heard that and believed it, why wouldn't you be moved with compassion? Why wouldn't you be moved to intercede? Um, Romans, I mean, uh, Hebrews 12 says, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And as horrible as this whole thing is, I believe that a lot of the religious pretense is being exposed for what it is. Um, by this we know that we have passed from death unto life, that we love the brethren. First John chapter 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God. He that loves not does not know God, for God is love. That's First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Um, I want to get into dueling prophecies, but I will prophesy that all these false prophets that disguise their homophobia and put it into prophecies and sermons to make money off fearful people who think this is the last days. They're afraid that their sons and daughters are going to turn gay. Let me tell you something. The world's not turning gay. I've said this over and over again. There's about 10% of the population that always has been, always will be. It is not unnatural. There are f f at least 1,500 species of animals that we know of that have same-sex pairing or homosexuality, as they like to call it. Um, I hesitate to call myself Christian sometimes these days because I hear the things that people say and call themselves Christians, and I say, look, I, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe all the Apostles' Creed. But if that's what a Christian is, then call me something else. Call me anything else, because I'm not that, and I don't want to be that. Let me close by saying, um, I am glad to be alive. I'm glad I am who I am. I am a gay man. I am married. I am monogamous. Uh, I live the truth, uh, unlike other people that I know that have committed suicide, because uh, they couldn't bear to tell the truth about themselves. Let me tell you something. The truth makes you free. I have no regrets about coming out. Uh, I'm proud of my marriage. I'm proud of my husband. I'm proud of what we have. Uh, I'm proud of my ministry. Um, I grieve for these people. I grieve for all who have been lost, but I would be lying if I didn't say that this one feels closer to home. Because when your tribe has been targeted, you can't help but feel it. Um, I love the city of Orlando. In the last few days, so many hard things have happened to Orlando. I can't imagine what the city's going through right now. Let me tell you something. When I say I'm praying for Orlando, I mean it. I'm not just saying it so that I can follow it up with a homophobic diatribe. I love you, Orlando. I love all those sweet people that were killed in that nightclub. Ooh, they were in a nightclub. Yeah, guess what? For gay people, clubs are one of the few sanctuaries that you have where you can go be yourself and be with the person that you love without fear of, hopefully, somebody coming in and killing you. And now we live in a very different reality because apparently that does happen after all. Um... You know, I like to leave you with a good, positive, upbeat word, but I feel very sober right now. Let me just say, I love you, and let everything that can be shaken be shaken. Have a good day.